that. Cool. Well, thank you everyone who's here and others that you have to join. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal and Fijigal people on which this gathering takes place. Acknowledge the, uh, sorry, uh, the elders, both past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continued connection to the land and, and the waters, waterways. Uh, my name's Hamish. I'm from Kua. Uh, we are a social enterprise who supplies world positive coffee to workplaces across Sydney and then collects the waste from those companies and delivers it here to the Renwick Sustainability Hub, where they're using that to create compost for their gardens. I'm joined today by Selena Griffith, who, if you'd like to join me, Selena. Hi, Hamish. And introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Selena Griffith. Um, I work at UNSW uh, and I'm a sustainability advocate as well as a design thinking academic and a permaculture gardener and I grow coffee, which I think is why I'm here today. Absolutely. Yeah, so Selena's going to run us through the process from crop to cup, which uh, for us, our whole kind of business model is built on knowing every single step of the journey and the value that's added along each of those steps. Uh, before I start, I start uh, going into the coffee side of things. We just wanted to let our online viewers know that we are outside in the beautiful community gardens and you will be getting quite a lot of bird chatter. Um, you should be able to hear us fine, but it's just to let you know if you hear loud squawking, it's not clean or up. Um, <laughs> unless the magpies fly down and yeah, unless they're it. interested to come in and join. <laughs> um, great. All right. Well, Selena, I'll let you take it away. We're going to start off with coffee plants in general, appearance. Uh, where would you start if you were to buy a coffee plant tomorrow and plant it in your own backyard? Right. Well, I bought a couple of coffee plants which are here, and these are both Arabica, but you can also buy Robusta uh, in Australia. And these were from my local nursery. Um, the lucky people who are here in person today, I'll be giving you some seeds to take home to, to grow or some berries to take home to grow. But they're a very robust plant. Um, then they're, they're pretty easy to grow. They don't like frost though. So you need to put them in a fairly uh, protected position from the wind that gets from about half a day's worth of sun. And they love really well-drained but rich soil. So um, the guys from Kua, uh, their coffee comes from Uganda and it's volcanic soil. So what I did to prepare my soil, which is quite loamy at my house, was to dig in some chicken manure uh, and some, scatter some rock dust, which gives a, a full spectrum of mineral into the soil. And that's all I did. Um, and I water mine with a little bit of seaweed, a little bit of comfrey tea, a little bit of worm tea, and that's about it. The rest is rain, sunshine, uh, and uh, a bit of good luck. Um, they're relatively hardy, pest resistant as well. These guys have a little bit of browning on the leaves from a cold winter, um, but most of the time, you can see the new growth here, really beautiful, glossy growth. Um, they hedge really, really well. They plant them relatively close together, but you get the best yield by um, planting them about a metre and a half apart. Uh, and you can see here that all the low um, offshoots have been cut off and that's to prevent things from climbing up uh, because these will become quite heavy with the cherries and, and, and touch the ground and you don't want them touching the ground because all sorts of things will come and eat your cherries out. I was just saying to everyone before you, if, uh, the, the uh, class arrive that I've never had anything eat my cherries until this year and I went down yesterday and found all these really little neat piles of um, cherry flesh chewed off and the seeds left behind, <laughs> all the, the, the beans left behind. And I don't know what it is, but I put a camera out to find out what it is. <laughs> um, I, it's definitely not the cockatoos because they would have just trashed everything. So it's probably a possum or something similar. But nice, um, we're potentially making our own luwak here in, in Sydney as a result. <laughs> um, I've got four of these, which makes me about now eight kilos of cherries a year, which translates down to about two and a half kilos of coffee, um, if, if I'm lucky. Now the berries grow along the nose, where the uh, on, on the on the um, arabica, uh, and they they come from the most incredible little flower um, that smells like vanilla. 
really beautiful the odor. So actually it's my favourite time of year is when these guys are flowering. And then around Christmas time they, they do start to get red. Um, this one's not quite ripe. Um, this one's nice and ripe, it's a bit squishy. And when you squeeze the cherries, you'll see that the, the, um, the little beans pop out. You get generally um, two or three beans per um, thing. This one's got three, um, but it's quite normal to just have two. Um, they're quite, you can eat these. They're not fantastic. They're very, very, very sweet. So you can imagine why. And um, I was in Hawaii a couple of years ago and I noticed that, if, uh, that they make tea out of these and also sometimes grind it back into the coffee mix to get a much sweeter berry flavoured coffee, which is I, I'm going to experiment with this year. Now, um, maintaining them uh, long term is really interesting. I, I have only had mine in for about eight years. But at about 12 years old, a lot of commercial um, coffee growers will completely coppice the, the plant uh, and then get another 12 years of growth out of it. Previously, they would probably just bulldoze and replant. Um, but it, it's, there's a, a you know, lot, lot of evidence now that it's better to not, not do that and just to get that extra life out of the plant by coppicing. Um, I haven't experimented with it yet. I will uh, when it comes time. Um, the other thing that it doesn't mean to coppice. To coppice um, you basically can just cut the whole top off the plant and then it will re-sprout out. Yeah. Yep, so in Uganda they have a process, uh, of, they call it stumping, but, okay. they're coping, but the same premise. So uh, and around three years the coffee trees will be producing sort of their best lots of coffee for around two years. At five years they'll completely stomp it and then they'll let the coffee grow, regrow. So a very similar yeah. process. And yeah. how, how much? How big do they get after that? So mine are about this big at the moment. Yep. I like to keep them about this high so I yeah. can manage. Um, they, they, they don't mind a bit of a haircut. So what do they do in Uganda? Yeah, very similar. So um, what you said earlier about the 1.5 meter spacing is relatively the same. Mm -hmm. And they'll tend to keep them around, I suppose, six foot head height and then allow them to branch out. And then in that way, uh, along with the pruning of the stump, you get the biggest sort of most laden trees you can without them rotting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they get very, very heavy when they're covered. Yeah. Because you, know, you can see how, how densely this is. These go to about this long. So they're, they're up like this when they flower and then they're down like this when it's ready for harvest. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed that also um, when I was in Hawaii and visiting the coffee plantations that sometimes they will add some green cherries into their mix get uh, uh, more protective in their flavour as well. Have you seen do that in Uganda? No, so what we um, have seen in Uganda is that uh, in the 1990s they actually liberalised the market and they had a massive influx of farmers and people cutting down other uh, crops so they could make way for coffee plants um, to sort of stabilise it and to get uh, higher quality coffees. Um, the coffee company we work with actually uh, generally tend to go 95% and above of red percentage that's actually being sold. In that way, the coffee growers are looking to uh, provide sort of quality product and they'll get a higher price for that as well. So um, if you pour the, the bag, you've got to actually knock it down here in front of us. Um, those guys pay some of the highest prices on the on nut that we work on. Um, yeah, so definitely you can, you'll have different grading as well. So lots that are, do you have mixed generally will grade a little bit lower, but yeah, you can get some very interesting flavours by doing it that way. Yeah. Now the anatomy of the of the cherry is quite interesting. So you have the cherry, which is very much looks very much like cherry on the inside. It's very fleshy. And then the beans are covered in this very slimy, sort of almost the texture of lychee. Um, and, and it's like this membrane over the top, and then there's a husk and then the berries are inside. So this becomes quite um, an interesting task for processing. And I'm going to show you the, all the different stages of processing and the different steps that you can take at home to process your own. I always have a joke with friends when they come to have a coffee. I said, it'll be the worst coffee you've ever had, but the most um, uh, precious coffee you've ever had. Yeah, that's rewarding. <laughs> 
uh, uh, but it's it's getting less and less the worst uh, coffee as I've learnt how to roast properly. Um, I was a very timid roaster when I started, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how you need to be brave with roasting coffee um, and how you need to experiment to work out what's right for your bushes. Um, I've got a friend who I got my plants from, and he lives uh, at the bottom of our hill, and his coffee tastes completely different to mine, even when I roast using the same equipment that he uses. And it's because his soil's got different nutrients in it and, it's, and, and he probably gets different amounts of sunshine. So you know, there's so many factors that can come into what can influence the flavour of the coffee that you're producing. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I don't fertilise them a huge amount. I do, um, uh, I've got a, I live on a slope and so it's very well drained and I have my chickens at the top and all the chicken manure I spread out and then we have a, a watering system that then carries that nutrients all down the slope to all the garden beds. So it gets, and I also, um, the system that I've set up, uh, set up also put worm, the worm stuff from my worm farm through and I also put in um, some comfrey tea. So there's a whole lot of range of nutrients but my soil when I first moved into my garden was extremely poor. And I'd have to put the, uh, the rock stuff in, which is a huge full range of rock and minerals. They're helpful plants in the garden. Yeah. And a bit of, um, I also mulch these guys um, with mulch from the garden um, because they, um, in winter, they, that keeps the roots warm. And in summer, it prevents them from drying out too much. So it's just a constant um, business. They like, they like stability. Yeah. The other thing that um, I'm not sure if you've tried yet, Selena, but if you don't use the cherry to, to make cascara tea or to mix back in with your beans, um, in Uganda they will actually keep all of these from the, the pitting process. So removing the beans will actually keep the cherry and then they keep it in a big pile pretty much fermenting and the farmers can actually carry that back up to their crops to fertilise it. So they just lay it around the base and it helps sort of maintain some of the nutrients. Yeah. yeah. Mine goes in the worm farm and they love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm going to start making tea out of it now that I've learnt about yeah, uh, sure. cascara tea. Yeah. 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 Any, did anyone else have any questions on growing? I live on um, the northern beaches in North Narrabeen. So we, yeah, we're on like a, it's like rock climbing to garden in my garden. We call it extreme gardening. <laughs> Yeah. And, and just for the guys on Zoom, you know, feel free to ask a question if you know you're welcome to ask questions too. Yep. Yeah, Julie and all. Oh, they can. Can you feel that? Can, I can hear them. Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Well. All right. Well, Selena, would you like to? Uh, sorry, Julian. You oh, just on that. Like, if you're asking questions, if you can say it really loud so the guys on Zoom can hear too. And I'll yeah. try my yeah. yeah, cool. So the last question was um, on fertilising. Yeah, and where where am I growing? I've seen them growing successfully all over Sydney, Marrick Field. Um, I've seen them out at La Perouse, I've seen them in in a west, so yeah. yeah. And, oh, very successfully in pots as well. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right, well, Selena, if you'd like to take us through the uh, steps for processing your coffee, so that would be picking, yep. removing the bean yep. and the mucilage, so your fermentation, yep. uh, and then moving on to milling and then finally to roast your coffee. Great. Well, um, it's quite a process and it, it, it takes a few days, um, but it's kind of fun and my kids like getting into it as well. So I picked these three days ago. Um, what you generally do is go down to the tree and pick the cherries that are dark red through to a purple. Um, so some of these um, all these were quite dark red when I uh, before I fermented them, and you can see now that that colour has come out into the water, and they're now looking a bit pale. But they were a good colour when I picked them, um, and then you ferment them for uh, two to three days, and that makes it easy to just pop the seeds out like this. Now um, straight water. It's just straight water, and it, it will actually get quite sticky um, and. Um, frothy and bubbly after a while. Um, because it's been cold the last couple of days, this one hasn't gone as frothy as usual. But you can see that it's very easy to pop the, the seeds out when you do this. Now, um, I then lay all the seeds out it's, uh, on a big um, woven rattan sim that I picked up at St Finney's. Someone's obviously bought that from some holiday somewhere. Um, and I just sit them out in the sun on my veranda to dry. And that takes a few days. 
But last night, I um, used my food dryer um, to get them dry enough for a demonstration today. So if you've got like a food dryer, you can you can get a higher energy use and, and try that. So um, do you want to pass these around and everyone can yeah, feel, sure. feel um, yeah. how slimy they are? Grab a few berry, berry uh, uh, bits and take them home. Um, I then... Uh, the drying process gets rid of that mucus or mucilage around the, the berry or the um, seed. And then we roll that. You can very painstakingly roll them in your fingers to get the actual bean out. So um, you can see that this is very dry and they look like a coffee bean, but it's like a Russian stacking doll. So the real bean is inside and is quite a different colour. And um, I was just supposed to show you earlier, in this tin, there's a whole lot of green. So now we, we then have to, we have to get, we have to get this skin off. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so these have been skinned, these ones haven't. So you can see the dry skin on the mucilage goes this creamy white colour or eggshell colour. It has white char. Um, and, and then there's still a skin under that. I uh, know, they, they, it's, that's the bean now. Okay. So you take that skin off. Now, um, I was very afraid the first time I did this, but a friend of mine said, get a blender and put them in the blender. Um, and you'll, I thought, well, I'd just make a huge mess with the blender. But what it does, and it's really nice that it's windy here today, <laughs> is if you don't have time to sit down and take that hard little calyx, you can put it through the blender. And it takes a lot of the hard work out of it. Takes a lot of the hard work out of it. Um, now that's a, a nutri bullet. It's a, probably a little bit too rigorous, um, but you can see now that I can just blow, blow that bit away, and there's my seed nicely ready for roasting. And that doesn't break up the beans? Um, not really. This one, this has a little bit because I haven't used the nutri bullet before. Um, I just normally put it in my normal blender and it, and it doesn't, um, my food processor, and it, uh, and it just knocks everything off with the food processor and you don't break the beans up. So that makes it very easy for roasting. Pop those back in there. So super fast, saves you lots of time. If you're like me, you've got kids at home that really like doing these silly things. It's kind of fun to, but it gets a bit boring coming to. Uh, enough for a cup of coffee let alone a, a whole jar Beautiful. okay yeah so so in uh see so again uh in sort of the industry way to do that um just very very quickly through the amount of time that it sits in here can uh change the way the coffee tastes as well so if you want to do a washed coffee that's a high in acidity and less sort of sweetness to it um maybe a day in the float tanks they'll take them out and push the the cherries out they'll then go onto bed drying is the most common way, or they'll go into big three ton, uh, pretty much heating tanks, which rotate them and get them down to the stage there that you saw with the parchment, and then uh, back into professional, enormous milling machines, which will take that off. Um, but it's essentially the same process on a, on a larger scale there. Um, one thing on processing from this sort of stage and the drying is that you'll have generally three different types um, of sort of varieties or like I guess we'd say sort of types of, of processed coffee that and they're the most common there's also different fermentation processes you can use but for the, for the basic sort of thing is that you have washed coffee which is very clean uh, it'll be quite high in acidity and a lot of the sweetness will have been taken out because it's been Sort of thoroughly washed, not fermented for as long. You've then got honey, which is sort of the one in the middle where it's maintained some of the sweetness from the mucilage and the cherry, and it's been soaked for a little bit longer and then bed dried without the cherry on. And then the third would be natural process, which is very common, um, especially in African countries where they have traditionally just done it in their own backyard 
got the cherries and let them sit out as is just in the cherry. Um, and that kind of gives you lots of fun and wacky flavors and a lot of sweetness and um, sort of really shows the flavor of the cherry. It's very, it's not like drinking coffee that's big. No, not at all. It's, it's very nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the next step then is down to actually roasting coffee. So Ooh. how have you been doing that with yours? So my advice that I was given, because I really didn't want to spend a few thousand on a roast start, was to do it in the oven or to get a popcorn maker. So again, went down to my favourite Savinis. Everyone gets these for Christmas and uses them twice and then they get passed on. So um, I roast in here. So I'm going to try and pinch a little bit out of there. When you roast coffee, they talk about the crack. So you listen to the coffee as it's roasting and you'll hear a crack and that's the first crack and that's a very lightly roasted coffee. And then you'll that's an yep. and then um, you'll listen again, hear a second crack and that's a medium, then you'll hear a third crack and that's a deep roasted. So this is kind of halfway between a light and a medium roasted coffee. Um, and you can see the colour difference between the two. The, un, the unroasted coffee, the roasted coffee, and then this is a, a medium, that's a medium roast? Yeah, yeah. this is a, similar, but this has actually got, it's a blend, so it's got two different types of processed coffee, so you'll see lighter ones, yeah. maybe not quite as light as the one Selena's got in the middle there, and then slightly darker. Yeah. yeah. And you can smell the difference between those guys, so I'll let yeah. you guys smell the, the jars a bit later. Um, it makes me feel really hungry. So, <laughs> right. so um, we'll pop it in the coffee in here. And how long roughly was that I'll taking? Listen. You just wait for the you cut? You have to listen. Yeah. So you can listen too. It's terrifying doing this. <laughs> it smells good. So you can start seeing that it's starting to brown if anyone wants to come and have a look. Wow, it must be throwing out some heat. Yeah, it goes out quite a bit of heat. And it's getting a little bit more of that uh, parchment off. Yep. So our roast will tend to take between 14 and 18 minutes. And uh, it's a similar sort of thing. So they're looking for a, a nice gradual development up to the first track. Yep. Uh, steadying out. The beans will actually hold a lot of heat. So um, often after the first track, they'll continue sort of climbing in temperature. Yep. And you'll just get all sorts of different flavors as it, as it heats up and yeah, yeah, you decide to take it out. Yeah, you can get, I, I got very impatient and also I was really unsure when I first started on how far to roast it. So I did a whole pile of them at different levels and yeah. then made cups of coffee out of all of them. Um, the one, the more roasted, the better it tasted, to be honest. Um, this is about the lightest that I do. But I like, like, a, like that. This is quite caramelly. Yeah. Um, and then when you get to the, 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 the darker, it feels a bit more bitter, the, the coffee, if you like a bitter coffee. Yeah. So this is, you can see this is completely changed colour now. Yeah. yeah. We're pretty close to the first crack, I think. And so you do all your sort of, uh, is it eight kilos you said? Around, you do it all through this. Well, there you Take go. a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and do you let the coffee rest at all before you drink it, or are you find it's okay to go? It's much nicer if you give it um, about two weeks. Yeah, yeah. two weeks seems to be two, yeah. two weeks is ideal. Yeah, so they're releasing CO2 the whole way through, yeah. and you tend to get a more balanced sort of so, flavor if you leave it a little while. So I tend to keep it in the cup, uh, in the, I fry it, and keep it in the um, parchment, and then roast it as I go. Um, I don't know how kosher that is. I haven't read anywhere that that's bad. Have you no, parchment's fine. parchment's fine. Yeah, so uh, a lot of farmers will do both the home process and sell, and okay, they'll keep parchment from the pot either. Sorry, just did its first crack. So, there we go. Yeah, it sounds like popcorn. popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and you can start to smell, you might be able to smell that that's starting to smell sound like. Uh, sounds like coffee, smells like coffee. Celeb. Yes. How, you know, like this overdoing it in an oven, which will obviously do bigger batches. Yeah. How do you, how do you choose? Um, well, I did my first light in the oven, yeah. and you've got to, it takes longer, um, and you've got to watch it all the time. Yeah. Um, this makes it to be a little bit more fun. <laughs> um, particularly if you're doing 
small volume. Um, you can get proper coffee roasters and you can set them and I'll do it. And um, I must admit now, last year I actually took most of mine down to a friend who had the coffee roaster oh, yeah. and yeah. said, can you do mine please for me so I can do it? Yeah. Um, because this is time consuming. But if you, yeah, when you've got your first bush, yeah, $5 for one of these. For sure, yeah. I mean, in a sample roaster, you maybe could do 300 grams at a time. Um, and that gives you, you know, sort of around 200 grams of roasted coffee. But um, that's still sort of $2,000 for one of those machines. So yeah. this is how my our roaster started. It's been doing 40 years of still getting my name now. My, uh, my mother tells me when she was young, she's now in her late 70s, there was a woman who lived next door to her who had a coffee tree, which was a very exotic plant back in the yeah. 1950s. And she used to roast hers in a kerosene tin over an open, open fire, <laughs> and they would drink coffee together. Um, which was a, you know, 1950 Australian coffee was not a, a very common thing. And this woman had brought the seeds with her from Malaysia um, when travelling to to Australia from England. Um, so uh, she's been drinking coffee, which is a different plant, um, and um, she asked for coffee seeds. And she was given coffee seeds, and 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 she, yeah, she had been growing them in a big backyard in Rockdale. Yeah, uh, no, just around in the yard. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So you can see now that this is actually yeah. at the second crack. It's just got a second crack. Yeah. It started, and it's looking, it's looking. Yeah, so it's about the same colour as that one. So we might take it to the third crack. What do you reckon? Risk it? Uh, yeah, I reckon we can. Yeah. And then in the meantime, yes. if you'd like to tell us a little bit about where you would go from here, so uh, to your grinding and then how you tend to drink it in just like a, a plunger or a... Oh, well, there's a, there's a whole lot of different colour here. I might talk about coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I have a coffee, I have two coffee grinders. I've got this fantastic old antique coffee grinder that you grind like this at home. And I think the kids have pissed it to do something with it because I couldn't find it this morning. Um, but it, it, it's from Germany and it's all hand painted with wildflowers. It's lovely. If you can't find one of those, you can get one of these. Um, so this is just an electric coffee grinder, and you just you just put your seeds in, and there's a whole lot of different ways you can grind. Um, so on this one, it's got a whole lot of settings. So there's fine espresso, medium drip, and coarse percolator. So you can work out what what you're wanting to do. I do it on the medium drip. Um, to the fine espresso, sort of on the edge. And I have my own coffee pot pod, like the same little coffee pods that I put in my pod machine, um, and that's the best for that. And then I find sort of the middle of that is really good if I'm using the. Um, I've also got one of those machines where you like to have a cafe, um, and it works quite well. <laughs> So that hasn't quite got there yet, but um, you can start seeing. So just gotta wait for all the lights to come. Now I think that just got to the third crack. Yeah, so you notice the colour actually changes a little bit as they settle as well, so it's quite dark, but um, I don't know, it'll sort of, yeah, it'll light up. Cool. Yeah, that looks They're very nice size, like very, yeah. So there's probably two cups of coffee there. It's a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of work for a cup of coffee, and that's why I'm very excited about finding out about these guys' circular economy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> which goes into my compost um, because I can't make enough at home to feed me all year, uh, to caffeinate me all year. Yeah, yeah it yeah. sounds really good. So then, um, just to give you an idea, that's, that's actually really, really nice. That's us now. And then, right there, and then, if 
फिर सामने देख fancy ones so this one's 80 grams to a liter of water and that just goes in the fridge for two days 48 hours and then it's good for about a week of drinking so you just remove the coffee that's sitting in the little filter there and then that drives to go it's a really easy way a really nice way actually to do it as well especially coming to summer and you can also do that without the like fancy bottle as well yeah that's right yeah so if you've got any sort of like filter or fine cloth you can just wrap up the 80 grams drop it in there and, and let it sit Right. And you can use it up. No, so you drink it you cold over it. ice is really yeah. nice, yeah. Or a little bit of milk if you like just over night. You could do um I tend to leave it for forty eight hours so that gets a bit better soak, but um yeah, it's also nice day would be fine. With a dash of coconut cream. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ice that's <laughs> really nice. That's for after a hot day of planning uh, yeah. your coffee bushes. <laughs> This one um, is um, a drip filter, so you put a um, um, paper liner in there yeah. and um, drip away. Yeah. This is another type of drip filter. Yeah. So that one's kind of your most popular. If you ever get, uh, you'll probably maybe see it at sort of, uh, I, I guess, fancy or co coffee sort of centric cafes. It's called a V60. So that's just a paper filter and a, and a pour over, which is really nice. And then I um, I, I put my own coffee pot, which is... I can do like five of my Monday morning and, or Sunday night, and I've got one every morning. But you can also get, um, uh, you can also just put in your normal espresso machine. Yeah. Um, you can plunge, um, I love uh, plunge coffee in the afternoon. Um, and uh, I also use the ground in lots of different ways. So a lot of people cook with it, so we might make brownies and put some of the grounds in the brownies. Um, Snails hate coffee ground, so if you've got a snail problem, put it around because um, they're a bit lumpy and sharp, so <laughs> they don't like uh, rubbing their little tender bellies over it. Um, the, the compost loves it, the worms love it, as long as you mix it up with a lot of other stuff. Um, and, you know, it has a lot of uses around the garden. And we've also had a, a go at using it for natural dyeing. Um, so the cherries make a really nice sort of a brash colour. And the, um, the coffee itself makes a, sort of a, a nice sort of creamy brown, so light brown colour in the natural dyes. So there's, there's lots of uses for the plant. I haven't really had much success dyeing with the leaves. Um, it tends to wash out. So. I think it puts all its efforts in pigments into the cherries. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other, I guess, things you could use the coffee for would be uh, one of our customers made kombucha with it. So fermented um, coffee to make that, which is actually really nice. That's amazing. I've also heard um, blending in for like malt beers. Uh, so any coffee type porter, you can actually use coffee, uh, coffee for that as well, which I haven't yet tried, but. Uh, oh, okay. Bread with, the bread with their coffee grounds yeah yeah um yeah so it's really cool and um sort of our, our aim is to not see it end up in landfill so if you can compost it um use it around your house in any way that's always better than just chucking it in the bin 
Yep. I have been told that you can use it and tea leaves for cleaning your floor. So you throw it on the wooden floor and then you sweep and they absorb the dirt off the floor and then you have a nice smelling house. We clean, clean disinfected floors yeah, because they, they do. have disinfected properties. Yeah, I think because yeah. coffee kind of just picks up all the odours around, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Beautiful. All right, well, thank you very much, Lena. We're now kind of into question time. So fire away if anyone on the Zoom call or, or here has anything else they'd like to ask us. Um, or coffee story. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, I went to Bali where they get the cats. Of the Luwak coffee? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you try the Luwak coffee? Yeah. What did you think? I can't remember. They gave us a cattle all different ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was a very nice session. Yeah. Very so nice day. The Luwak yeah. look, looks a bit like a possum, and what it does is it eats the coffee beans and then digests the cherry and then poos the coffee out, uh, poos the beans out, so it's been through their digestive system. And then someone goes and collects the poo. Um, and washes them off and roasts the coffee. And it's supposed to, at one point it was a very expensive coffee to buy. Yeah. Not so much anymore. It's quite, I find it quite nutty and bitter at the same time when I've tried it. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the welfare of the Luwak because it's now farmed. So these poor creatures are now caged and drugged um, for making it. Probably the ethics is a bit questionable, but um, yeah, it's an interesting interesting way of producing coffee. Yeah. You guys can design a giant automatic stomach that should do that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like they have a robot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. 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 fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I actually had a question from someone on uh, Tassie. Yes. Is it possible to grow coffee? In a greenhouse. In a greenhouse. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they just don't like frost, so if you can prevent them from getting frost, so either in a greenhouse or in um, a part of the garden that doesn't like you might surround it with other plants that could keep it protected. So these guys are getting planted, Julian tells us, next to some bananas, which is fantastic because um, the banana circle here will have lots of nice nutrients being put into it. Um, and that means that there's a lot of nutrients for these guys. Also offers a bit of protection and keeps them. They don't like being in the wind either. They, they like to have good airflow, but not wind. Yeah. How big do they get? Um, I so I can't really tell you because I, I see that mine are about this big at the moment and I normally like to keep them about the same height as me so I'm not reaching up to, to do it. So you, you keep cutting it to the way you want it. Yeah. Are you netting them? I don't net. I think I need to start now. <laughs> or I need to find out what's uh, raiding my coffee cherries. Yeah. So up until now you haven't had any sort of haven't pests had any pests. So, right. um, Obviously, something's discovered them. I've had them for eight years, um, and they've been pretty for six. So, yeah, I don't know what's discovered them, but we will find out. <laughs> probably the uh, 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 probably the ringtail possums. They, um, yeah, and I, I love them, so I probably will not net Sacrifice and just. Um, I might just collect all the beans off the ground. It saves me saves me having to process them like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see. we'll have our own <laughs> version. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. We might have circumvented that process. Yeah. I've seen them growing outdoors in pots. Um, they do like good sun, so if you've got a good sunny position, you can try. And if it starts looking unhappy, then move it outside. Yeah. Mine was growing in a, a renovation. Yeah. Mine was growing in a garbage bin. Um, and it started fruiting this year, but that was it's been outside. It's been outside, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. No drainage in. Yeah. Okay. They don't. They don't have a. They they don't put their roots down deep or broad. They have quite a ball of root, which is about the same width as the tree. Uh, that makes sense because when it rains, the drip line of yeah. the tree will then feed that water back into the the roots. Um, so you can see they've got quite fine fibrous roots. So. Um, pot's quite ideal for coffee. Yeah. But if, you know, again, if you want to be making a lot of coffee, you have to have eight of them inside. Yeah. You have no. a jungle. It's more like, <laughs> probably just because I like the pine. Yeah. I reckon it'll look good. Yeah and, yeah, and again, when it flowers, it'll be amazing. Yeah. You'll have to hand pollinate it. Yeah. Um, so you're getting with paintbrush and, yeah. and, and uh, do the plant sex thing so that you get some cherries, otherwise you won't get any. Yeah, so what Okay, this is really interesting. So my native bees, Australian native bees, love it. 
Um, and I've noticed that a lot of the blue banded bees like it. Um, they're bug pollinators, so I thought they wouldn't like it because the flowers don't lend themselves to bug pollination. Um, the normal European honeybees like it, but I also get a lot of moths and uh, butterflies, and um, there are a lot of flies in Australia that are pollinated, so the blue bottle fly loves it. Yeah. And, um, Oh, okay. Yeah, it's about. Um, generally, they flower just after they fruit, almost immediately after they fruit. And I get two lots of fruit a year off mine. So, um, yes, if yours are budding up now, that's about right. They'll flower in December, and um, they smell oh, beautiful. And you want you'll want to eat the flowers. They smell so good. Um, you know, I, 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 I actually just bought a little distilling kit, and I'm going to try and make essential oil out of them this year that, that will get from it um and and they're stunning they just because they're all the flowers are just at the bases of the leaves and so it just looks really beautiful that really strong um dark green with the white flowers and that's particularly in, in the evening it's like um citrus smells fantastic in the afternoons it's the same and then the cherries will start to develop no no, 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 you only need one. But um, again, the, the, it's nice to say here I have a coffee plant in my garden, but only one's not going to really produce enough for you. So having a few, I would recommend. My um, The Arabica is a much more prolific producer than the Robusta in my garden. Um, it, it has much less leaves and much longer branches and, and they clump along the branch. Um, it looks a lot, when you plant them together, one looks like a very sick version of the other, um, but it's just the way they are. Yeah. And I, I roast them together. Julian? Just checking in to see if anybody on Zoom would like to ask a question. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Could I ask them now? Sure. Yeah. Go for it, Julian. Hi, thanks. Um, so my coffee tree is about eight years old as well, and but the, the cherries on them, um, they ripen up at different stages and I wanted to know what to do with the ones that I've already picked while I'm waiting for the rest of them to come along. I'll ferment them and dry them and then keep all the dried ones together. Make sure that they're thoroughly dried. Last year I rushed mine, put them in a jar and they all went mouldy so um, you might want to keep them open and aired um, whilst you're waiting for the others to right, get great. ready. Thank you. And the other question was um, doing it in the popcorn machine. If I want to do a lot, I'd just stick with the oven, wouldn't I? Yeah, stick, definitely with, yeah. stick with the oven or a fry pan. You can do it in a fry pan as long as you're willing to stand there and um, observe what's going on because they crack very quickly and you can easily burn them. Right. And Thank you so much. You can miss the, miss the crack because you can't hear through the glass. Ah, okay. Thank you. That's all right, Julian. Around, uh, I think it's uh, around 180, 190 degrees should be your first crack. So that's a bit of a ball, ball point for that. Um, and for your first question, Gillian, um, I think it came up before about whether you can store parchment. And often farmers will sell um, during the season and they'll dry and keep some parchment for later, sort of like a bank for them. So you can sell it and it'll be completely fine for them to process afterwards. But yeah, definitely drying is a sort of essential thing for them. Make sure they're nice and dry before you put them away. Yeah. Thank no, you. Yeah. Any other questions from the, the world out there, Julia? Uh, nope, yep. we're good. Thank you. Sorry, it looked like somebody was just about to ask a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go for it. Go. You've done? Yeah, that was. Oh, we got one of that. Yep. Yeah. You've mentioned a lot of different ways of grading coffee, and I was wondering if there was a way to put you in the back of the Oh, you were the coffee. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah, so if you're preparing sort of in a cold route or a filter, um, you could go for like a single. Um, so if you're looking at one type of bean in the same location and in like a honey process or a natural process, um, you'll get like really nice sweet flavors out of these 
filter. Um, they'll roast it a bit more lightly, so it stays sort of nice and sweet. Uh, for your espresso, depending on what you like, if you like the darker sort of Italian roasted things, that will be a blend of Arabica and Robusta, which has sort of ma maybe like a bit more burnt, bittery taste. Um, and that's darker. Yeah. And that'll be in a darker roast, yeah. Yep. Or you can go for Arabica. Ours is about a medium, so it's somewhere between where you still get a lot of acidity. You also get the um, sort of chocolatey caramel notes in the middle as well. Um, the other thing would be brine. So if you're using your own coffee, just sort of experiment with what you think's good. Um, espresso is very, very fine. And then you go through the filters and it gets a bit coarser uh, in the grind. You can buy them all pre-grinded, but I definitely recommend if you are interested in like trying different uh, sort of brewing methods to always buy whole bean. Um, and then grind them after because you lose the flavour very quickly once it's ground. You just reminded me of two other awesome coffee ground pieces. Yeah. So I make soap using my coffee oh, grounds, yeah. um, which is a fantastic garden soap because it's got that texture in it um, and it's really great in exfoliant. The other one is body scrub, um, where you just get some nice almond oil or olive oil and salt and the coffee grounds, you mix them all together and use that as a body scrub um, at the end of the tub. Yeah, it's already not where I'm in the summer to get yourself ready for winter, but um, yeah, it's another good way to use the ground. Yeah, it's an excellent way. We've actually done that with some of our customers um, using the spank grounds sort of that they've drank through the office and then mixing it with sort of uh, you know, some vanilla and coconut oils. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes out really nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Would we like to do the planting? Let's do the planting. We, yep. Yep. Would, would, uh, for you on Zoom, would you mind just yelling out if you'd like to come with us and watch the planting? Um, I, I'm okay, thanks. But um, you can, <laughs> I've got mine planted already. So, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. What we'll do is for, for you on Zoom, we're, we're probably at the end of this section, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, if if you stay on and don't leave, we'll take you with us into the garden. But um, if you've all left, then we know that you've, you've finished at this part and uh, I'll switch off the camera. So you, you can vote, vote with your mouse. <laughs> but thank you very much to um, Kua, Digby, Hamish and Selena. Thanks, Julian. And Randwick uh, Community uh, Sustainability Hub is fantastic. So if you guys have been down here, come and visit. Yep. Meet the birds, listen to them. <laughs> yeah, the guys at Zoom have been loving the birds. Yeah. And I, I guess what we do here with Kua is we, um, we take coffee grounds. And so complete that loop there with the coffee grounds and turn it into compost in those bins over there. Mm -hmm. ah, which then goes into all the veggie growing around here. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, thank you all for coming. Okay. <laughs> Cheers.